Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Beautiful and Bothered with me, Johnny Ross. Today's episode is so incredibly important to me. I had such a moving conversation with Coco Peru, and I can't thank her enough for her vulnerability and the things she shared and her honesty. The entire time I was speaking with her, it was so evident to me how much she is a pillar of strength and has been and will always be for the LGBT community, how impactful her legacy has been. And I want to get right to the interview because I think this conversation is needed now more than ever. I only hope that I held my own. I was incredibly nervous. I have idolized Coco for many, many, many years. But without any further ado, let's dive into my interview with Coco Peru. For more than three decades, my guest has been a predominant and legendary figure in the LGBT community, an actress with an impressive resume of feature films, including Trick, Tu Wang Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, and Girls Will Be Girls. TV shows such as How I Met Your Mother, Arrested Development, and Will and Grace. Her iconic voice can currently be heard as Pauline in the Netflix show Dead End Paranormal Park. She has earned worldwide acclaim for her award award-winning solo shows and conducted live career retrospectives for icons such as Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, Liza Minnelli, and the late B. Arthur. She was awarded the Los Angeles LGBT Center's Board of Directors Award for her unwavering activism and support for the LGBT community, support that is needed now more than ever. And while these words get thrown around far too easily nowadays, I can say without a doubt, she is a true legend icon. She is the one and only Miss Coco Peru. How are you? Well, hello there. Thank you for that lovely introduction. It wrote itself. And I really mean it. This has to be one of the most exciting interviews I've ever done. Here's something exciting for you. I don't know if you can hear it, but my husband made lentil soup in a pot over there. It's one of those pressure cookers. Yes. And it just finished, and it's making that steaming noise as little like it depressurizes. So it's like, yes. I don't know if you can hear it. But I can't. If you hear that, that's my lentil soup. I love that. Nobody's more familiar with your YouTube channel than me. I have seen every <laughs> video. I've seen every cup of tension tamer tea being made. It feels very fitting that there's lentil soup being okay. made. <laughs> I, I said, I have an interview. That soup needs to be done. Yeah. And so he said, it just finished but I can still hear it simmering down. Perfect timing. I have so much I want to ask you. I mean, there have been so many moments throughout your career that have resonated with me, but I always like to, whenever I speak with someone, kind of take it back to the beginning and kind of get an understanding of where it all started and what the inspiration was, because I think that's so important for how it informs the way we navigate our career. So where did you grow up and how was it in that space kind of navigating adolescence, especially as a queer person? Well, it wasn't fun, <laughs> first of all. No, I grew up in the Bronx. Most people, when they hear the Bronx, they think of the Bronx that's depicted in, in you know, TV and films. But I grew up in a on a little island in the North Bronx called City Island. So it was very nautical and very beautiful in a way. Beautiful sunsets. You know, we had little beaches that we could swim in the water. But it was not easy being in that working class community, being mm -hmm. so effeminate as a little boy. And so I was bullied quite severely as a kid, mm -hmm. starting in, I would say, around second grade. But I would even say as early as kindergarten is when I started to notice that I was different with little messages I was getting. And that's when people talk about grooming nowadays. It's like, I was the one groomed. Mm -hmm. We're all groomed. Yeah. We're all groomed to be straight. Yes. And so there was like a little village set up in our kindergarten room where it had to have a little post office. They had a little shopping. It was like playtime. Yeah. And I grabbed a little basket and I was shopping and the teacher took it away from me. And she said, no, that's a girl thing. You have to go work in the post office. And another time later, I talk about this in one of my shows, I had taken a, the triangle musical instrument. They had different things you could choose and I chose the triangle, but this girl in my class, she wanted the triangle. The teacher took it away and said, that, that triangle is for girls. Oh. Like somehow that little tingy yeah, yeah. was too feminine for a boy and I was handed two blocks of wood covered in sandpaper. <laughs> That's when all this bitterness started. Yes, that's when the trauma started. <laughs> that's when the trauma started early on. But the name calling started in second grade. Yeah. 
And it went throughout high school and even into my first year in college. And then it kind of cooled off. Yeah. It was, so it was not easy, but I will say that I feel like I learned how to survive. And I also had a terrible accident when I was 16 years old in which I did die and lost most of my blood. It was horrifying. You're kidding. And that's why I walk funny as Coco. I have a bad leg from it. But that trauma of the accident in, in a weird way gave me a lot of strength because I realized that I had survived something most people maybe wow. would not have. Yeah. And that, I don't know, it did something to me. Mm-hmm. It almost felt like it wasn't an accident, even though I know it was, but it, I learned something from it and it yeah. d- didn't all come at once like an aha moment, but yeah. it was gradual. It, yeah. And then Coco came about later in my life, but that was yeah. another layer of reclaiming myself. There's things you go through that almost allow you, like you're saying, to shed that pretense of all that is thrust upon us when we're so little. And I've had conversations with family and friends before about the grooming to be straight, but I'll never forget my niece who, I'm very close with my nieces, but my niece one time who loves my fiance, him and I kissed in front of her and she was three years old and said to us, you're two boys, you're not supposed to do that. And it hit me where I was like, you know, it has nothing to do with sex. It's about the visibility and demonstrating love between people that are not heterosexuals that inform so young, because I was the same way. It happened so young that it incepts kindergarten, first grade, second grade. And that's where it starts to bake in to that young of children that who they fundamentally are is incorrect. And yeah, yeah, it, it's it's frightening. So what inspired the creation of Coco Peru? I developed a sense of humor from all the trauma, that's yes. for sure. And my sense of humor, although I try to keep it very light in my shows, it can also get pretty dark. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to be an activist. I was deeply affected witnessing all of the AIDS activism that was happening in New York City in the late 80s and 90s. And I wanted to be a part of that. I went to my first ACT UP meeting and it turned out to be my last one because I was too immature to take on all of that rage. Mm. But it got me thinking about how could I change the world. And I always knew that storytelling was a way to reach people, whether or not you were trying to change their way of thinking about who you are or whether it was just to inspire your own community. Yeah. You know? And so I started writing a a show and I decided I was going to do it in drag because I had been inspired by Charles Bush, who was doing uh, his play back then in New York city and, and his sidekick, Julie Halston, who had a very New York accent. And so Charles was playing the female lead and Julie Halston was this sort of New York accent. And those were the two things that I had been shamed about in college and theater school. Mm -hmm. It was telling me to butch up and lose the Bronx accent. And here were two people being celebrated as being feminine and with this heavy New York accent. That was her authentic accent. And so in that moment, I thought, this is the world I want to live in. That got me thinking about drag. But there was also a moment, I talk about this in my show, um, where I was in Peru with my first boyfriend and I met a drag queen named Coco. And he was a beautiful boy who came out as this beautiful showgirl. But she was on television all the time. And I found that fascinating that in the 1980s, this is before I created Coco, a drag queen in such a Catholic country. And Peru has changed in the last 30-something years. But back in the 80s, I just couldn't believe that this drag queen had crossed over into the mainstream. and was kind of loved. Yeah. And so it got me thinking about owning one's self that the human brain is somehow wired to respect. And it was interesting that when I did create Coco and I would be on the train with just the makeup on, Mm -hmm. people felt it was okay to make fun of me and call me names. But when I went on the train dressed fully as Coco, people left me alone because I was owning it all. Yes. I think people recognize that and go, okay, Mm -hmm. mm mm-hmm. Yeah. My, might not agree with it, but I better keep my mouth shut. Yeah. I wish more people would mind their business nowadays and keep their mouth shut. I have been so full of rage lately with yeah. these anti-trans bills and anti-drag bills. I actually found myself dissociating yeah. from the news about it because I couldn't handle my rage. Mm-hmm. I wasn't aware that I was doing it. I, I thought about why am I not 
really fully diving into this. And I realized that it was like sort of traumatic yeah. to have to see the things that people write and these bills and whatnot. And I'm so proud in a way of young people yeah. who are yeah. using social media to reach out, who are making demands of some people who have uh, visibility to say, hey, when are you going to speak up? The young people, and that's where my hope lies really nowadays. Yeah. I have to go back and punctuate something you said that just blew my mind, which was I was too immature to take on all that rage. And I've never thought of it that way because I went through a lot of very heavy things when I was young. It wasn't until I was in my late 20s, early 30s that I started to even process that's exactly what it was, that inability to handle that amount of it. And I think as a millennial, there have been so many moments over the past 15, 20 years where it feels like the sky is falling. But for someone like you that has lived through the AIDS epidemic, going to ACT UP and, and fighting for progress, does it feel like a backslide? How does it inform almost how you're processing what's happening right now? I'm still processing it. Yeah. So I'm not sure I have the yeah. answer. Yet. Yeah. All I know is being quiet doesn't work. Yeah. I learned that in my 20s. I say this in my new show, silence equals repression, silence equals death. Yeah. We have to be loud and, and we have to have conversations with our community, the people we work with, our families. You know, that was early in the years. That's why we were always encouraging people to be out. Yeah. Like people say, well, I don't need to tell my family because they don't, you know, they're not real. And it's like, yes, but if they know they have a queer person in their family, they might vote differently. They might see things differently. Yeah. And so um, I think those kind of conversations have to happen. I think most Americans are probably okay with this but what's so evil and sick is the way they've worded these bills that people who will come see my show will still say well but it, you do have to protect children and this and that that's what's so evil about mm -hmm. the way they've worded some of this stuff they're yes. not stupid when it comes to how to uh manipulate uh, yeah. the conversation yeah and so that's where our community has to be really smart the hypocrisy of this entire situation to me is staggering I, I don't know if you've seen it but there's a brooke shields documentary coming out next month where she basically explains that in her time of getting famous it was almost this response to the liberation of women the system was like okay you you think you don't need us or you think you're independent this mass wave of sexualization of young girls of what she went through because it was like you think you're independent we could always find someone younger and prettier and all of that heteronormative behavior is never called into question. High school and elementary school which was I hope rare there was three instances that teachers of mine, heterosexual, were all arrested for pedophilia. There's no mandates coming about straight male teachers being with children. It, it's a very, very easy scapegoat to unload their other feelings on said community, etc. And be like, oh, wait, no, that's the problem. Because now I'm being told right. that's what it is. No, it isn't. Right. No one wants to educate themselves on it. And no one understands the culture. So it's easy to attack well, in that empathy. way. It, yeah, and, and exactly. there's a lack of empathy nowadays of wanting to understand other people. Yeah. It's, it's too much of an effort, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they don't want to do the work that m it might take to really understand. And there's a lot of people whose lives are un unfulfilled yeah. in many ways. And so they will look at someone like me who had the courage to be authentic and succeed despite everything that is set up against me. Yeah. I still manage to have a successful life. Mm -hmm. And that must drive them crazy. Absolutely. The other thing that's interesting to me was that every year we go to Spain and many, many years ago, we were at a drag show on the beach. It was like in one of these like shacks and one. It was really a lot of fun, but the gay community and the straight community in this area are really mixed yeah. very much. So straight people will come to see the shows and they bring their kids. Mm. And these drag queens, you know, they're, they're doing all the dancing and whatnot. They have the big breasts and what yeah. the kids thought it was hilarious. It was like clowns to them. Right. Exactly. But then there were a couple of jokes that were very like off color. Yeah. And then one of the kids was like, I have jokes to tell. And they weren't even sitting with their parents. The parents let them sit right up front, almost at like the kids table. Mm -hmm. And then this little boy got up, he took the mic and the drag queen gave him the mic and he started telling really dirty jokes. <laughs> yeah. 
And everybody was hysterical laughing. And I thought back to my childhood where it was like, I hung around a lot of adults and my parents' friends and mm-hmm. I told dirty jokes. It was like a different time, I understand, but like no one thought that that was wrong. Half the times I probably didn't even understand the jokes I was telling. Yeah. I just was knew I was getting a laugh from adults. Yeah. It didn't affect me. You know, what did affect me was the priest that touched me inappropriately. Mm-hmm. That affected me. It was the bullying that affected me. It was the teachers who heard the bullying and didn't know how to address it and so ignored it. Yeah. It was all those messages I got that I was wrong. Yeah. It was the woman who said to me one day, oh, you're getting so big now and someday you're going to grow up and become a priest. Because that's what they associated. The only thing a very queer child could grow up to be was a priest. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember thinking, I don't want to be a priest. I want to be famous. You know, I wanted to be an actor. Yeah. But I knew what she meant. Yeah. It was so shaming to me. Yes. That's what was damaging. Wow. Not the dirty jokes. I remember watching Charles Pierce on HBO as a young, young teenager. Loved it. Uh, Waylon Flowers and Madam was a puppet. Yes. And I always thought of Waylon Flowers as a drag queen. His drag was this puppet, Madam. Yeah. Some of his jokes were very dirty. Mm-hmm. And I was titillated by it. It, yeah. it didn't disturb me. Yeah. The church screwed me over. Yeah. And my community screwed me over. And my teachers screwed me over. And it was finally unleashing my voice as Coca Peru that that gave me my voice back. And also the queer community. Yeah. That made me whole again. Yeah. I think you're such a brilliant storyteller. And I love that kind of entertainment. So how important is storytelling to you? And what is your process like when you're choosing to share certain things about your experience. Storytelling is everything to me. Yeah. I think it's what will save the world, Mm -hmm. ultimately. I think storytelling is a lost art and and we need to get it back because stories bring people together like theater. And my process is usually just, you know, if I'm at a party and I tell a funny story and people are like, that's funny, I'll I'll mentally think, okay, I got to remember it. That's (laughs) a good story. But my stories always have to have some point of view. They're not just about me. Mm-hmm. they're told in a way that everybody can relate to it. And I want everybody to think of a moment in their life that's similar. Yeah. You know, so yeah. they walk away feeling like it was group therapy. Yes. Not just me talking about myself. Yes. So often that's the one thing that people will say. It was like, I needed to hear that. I needed yeah. to hear all of that. Yeah. Or that was like church or, you know. Yeah. So that's my passion for storytelling. Yeah. And I grew up around a lot of very funny storytellers. So early on, I I learned how to tell a story. I know we're both massive fans of theater. So I want to ask, is there any shows that come to mind that stick with you as really maybe being transformative or that you have a lot of affinity for? That I've seen? That you've seen, that you've listened to, any theater that you connect with. Oh, God, there's so many. I know. You know, early on, I was addicted as a really young child. To Fiddler on the Roof. Yes. And I used to wear, I'm not Jewish, but I used to wear a yarmulke on the Yes. House. My mother <laughs> would let me wear it in the house, not outside. Yeah. And I was obsessed with that show. Oh. And it's interesting because that show does deal with some very heavy yes. things. When I was a kid, I used to cry listening to Man of La Mancha. Yes. And that song, The Impossible Dream. hmm That resonated with me as a kid um, because I think I recognized that early on that my life was not going to be easy. And yet I still had these dreams that just seemed impossible that I would ever achieve them. And I remember one instance in particular laying on our couch. I froze in, in like this realization that I was never going to love and I was never going to be loved. I was never going to be able to do what I wanted to do with my life. And the the fears were so big that I literally froze and couldn't move on the couch. Yeah. You know, the fact that I did achieve maybe not the heights of, a, you know, what people think of a career, but I think I have a good life yeah. and I achieved a lot given what I went through. And I was able to take all of that pain and that suffering and trauma and somehow use it in my career 
to make other people feel better. Yeah. You know, and in a way, make myself feel better. Yes. By telling your story, the people receiving it reflected back to you. And that can be very healing. And I think that's why I loved theater as much as I did and found it so young was because it was one of the only outlets that had that internal dialogue reflected back to you in such a meaningful way. But wow, that really moves me, what you said about being paralyzed by the notion of not being loved, because I went through that myself. It's it's heartbreaking, because that's an element I don't think people understand everything that's happening right now. It has such shockwaves beyond just the one little thing. It it really, it incepts every element of your development. I will say this, you know, my parents were both uneducated. My dad was a truck driver. My mom worked as a waitress and then later as a secretary when we needed money. We were not rich by any means, lower middle class. And I was just like really effeminate kid. And I I think it affected my relationship with my father, of course. Mm. And, but when I finally did come out and then when I told them I was going to do Coco, I was very fortunate of how supportive they were. And my dad was very, very proud of me. Yeah. And to this day, my mom is like my number one fan. She's now 96. And and I sometimes look at these people that write such cruel things to me. I want to invite them to say that to my mom's face. And I think if my mother and my father could have those kind of huge breakthroughs to not only accept me, but to celebrate what I do, yeah. then surely with all the information that's out there on the internet and all the people and all the experience, you could try a little harder. Yeah. Because my parents had nothing. The only thing they had was me saying to them, ask any stupid questions. I'm here. I'll give you answers. And they asked stupid questions and I didn't freak out or anything. I, I let them ask all the frustrating, stupid questions. And I educated my parents. Yeah. And my mom said, I know I was supposed to have you. And I said, why are you saying that? And she says, because I realized that there was still so much I had to learn. People are such idiots nowadays. I think, you know, my mom. I know. Figured it out. Certainly you could try a little bit harder. You know, human sexuality isn't, as we've discovered, isn't, you know, black and white. There's a whole rainbow in there. Yes. And and people are afraid to address that rainbow within themselves. It's that fine line of Mm -hmm. wanting to offer these people a hand in a way. I know. Because they're obviously, they're struggling. And my nieces and nephews, my brother remarried a black woman, said they grew up with a black grandmother. And they grew up with the drag queen uncle who has a husband. (laughs) Yeah. And so that was normal to them. Yeah. My mother had pictures of both my husband and I around the house and also pictures of me as Coco around her house. They grew up seeing that. They learned in grammar school about racism and homophobia. Mm-hmm. And they were shocked because they wow. weren't taught that at home. Yeah. So they're struggling now Yeah. knowing that the world is not what they thought it was. They didn't know racism. They have black cousins and aunts and uncles and grandma and queer uncle who dresses in drag. And they always thought that was hysterical and yeah. so funny. And I remember one time my niece was at school and I think she was in the second grade and she was telling all of her friends, oh, my uncle, he dresses up as a girl and his name is Coco Pru and he's so funny and da, 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 da. And my niece's mom was standing there like, oh God. Yeah, uh-oh. Do yeah. I shut her up? Yeah. And shame her? Yeah. Or do I allow her to express who her family is to her friends? Yeah. You know, and they live in Florida now, and that's now something that's in that weird don't say gay law. It's like, would she then be with those parents then report? And it's just. I know. I- to grow up where you did and have that challenge and then create Coco. What was the first moment, especially in transitioning into television and film or wanting to be in television and film, what was the first moment that you felt like, whoa, the big break moment or the feeling of maybe I could do this? I was doing my one person show in New York Mm -hmm. and I started to realize I thought Coco was going to be one thing that I did and then I would do other things. Yeah. But I started to realize really quickly Coco was resonating with people and not just 
the gay people that were showing up to my show, but like with reviewers. So I started mm. to get reviewed in like the major papers. Mm. And that gave me some clout, as you would say, because, yeah. you know, I was a drag queen and I was political mm. and I was expressing my rage on stage. And so I was being recognized for all of that. And that was very, very exciting. Yeah. Um, but the first time that I felt like recognized across the country was when Trick came out. That was in 1999, and that sort of put me on the map across the nation in the gay community. I mentioned it before. Will and Grace was my only, the only queer person I saw on TV. And I remember I used to, before I could drive, I would, you know, bribe my sisters to drive me to the mall so I could buy the box set, come home, and I'd watch all 20 five episodes in a day overnight. And I obviously remember very distinctly your uh, episode on the original run. What was the process like getting that on the original run? And then what did it almost mean to you to be welcomed back on the reboot and have such a predominant role as you did? Two of the writers on the show were people I knew from New York. I knew them when they were poor and we were just all struggling. They had some great fortune. They were also, they were also very talented yeah. and they got hired onto Will and Grace. Max Munchnik, who was one of the creators, mm -hmm. he's also a fan of mine. And so I did have to audition, yeah. but it was pretty understood that they were going to give it to me. I just had to like not screw up the audition. <laughs> yeah, I was very nervous, but it, it was fun. Mm -hmm. But it was a different time. You know, Jack, the character Jack, didn't have a boyfriend. They, you wouldn't let that sort of effeminate, over-the-top character have feelings. You, you know what I mean? It was like... Be a full it person. A it could yes. be a full person. Yes. And so when I did that episode on the phone, I really thought, well, that's great. And these people know me. There's a good chance I'll be invited back. And of course I wasn't, but that was okay. But I always thought that's a shame because I, yeah. it would have been great to have a drag presence, I thought, on that yes. show. So when they came back with the reboot and I was written into it, I realized it was a moment of, God, so much has changed in the world. Look, yeah. Jack is now not only dating somebody, he's getting married. Mm -hmm. Gay marriage has been passed. And then I went back on the show and... From the top people right down to the people who were building the sets and designing the sets, they made every effort to celebrate me. Yeah. And I'm talking, there were CDs made in the club that had my yeah. photo on it. There were little um, coasters that nobody would ever see yeah. on their little TV yeah. screens, Aww. but they had it all out there Yeah, just to make me feel celebrated. Yeah. And I thought that was... Such a gift and so lovely. And I think part of that was they recognized, wow, this drag queen has survived all these years yeah. in this community. And let's give it this part and yeah. flesh it out. And it was great yeah. fun for me. Did you ever think even in your original role, even in that episode where you're saying, mother, would you get the door? Because a drag queen, of course, would still live with his mother. And that lack of those little things compared mm -hmm. to in the reboot, to establish you as this bar owner and this completely independent, successful person. That's correct. Yeah. And I even remember thinking back then, why am I living with my mother? Yeah. But I wasn't going to say anything. Oh, because, yes. Yes. You know. Yeah. But this time around, there were a couple of lines that I wasn't comfortable saying. And so I did say something. Oh, good for you. Anyway, it, it, it was very interesting. And I will yeah. say this. The first time I was on the show, I, I didn't feel like the whole crew and whatnot. There was a, a nervousness around me because I was a drag queen. Mm. And that was not the case this time around. Oh. It was like everybody was so into yeah. it. Yeah, they're yeah. probably mo the most I mean, excited. Even like the straight techy guys were totally yeah. like, "Hey, Coco, and it's so good to have you back." And it was like, "Okay, this is totally different than the first time I was on this show." Yeah, and, and I don't mean to to make it sound like the first time was wonderful. I oh, had a great yeah. time. It was the um, time, but this exactly what a what an amazing moment because not many people get that full circle experience and your storylines and your presence on the reboot was one of my favorite parts of it because it felt like the most natural and organic update to the current queer community i also want to ask you from a very young age i've always 
connected with the legends, your Carol Burnett's and Lucille Ball, mm -hmm. and speaking to those legends and what they're able to teach you, going back to the storytelling element, your conversations with Coco interviews. I mean, you've interviewed Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda, Liza Minnelli, B. Arthur. And I have to ask, because I, I felt this way going into this interview with you, what are some of the memories you have that A, really stick with you, whether it was a personal achievement in that moment or something that maybe they said that you extracted from them or heard from them that really stuck with you? I've met so many of my idols and every time I meet one, it's like, it's a gift from the universe saying, yeah. you made the right choice. The choice was scary and dangerous at the time. And everybody told you it was the end of your career, but you made the right choice by choosing to be Coco Peru. You know, B. Arthur for me was my idol growing up. And so the fact that I got to meet her was one thing. The fact that I got to become friends with her was something oh. that completely blew me away. Yeah. But the one thing that I, 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 I'll always remember, I'm, she said so many great things yeah, in my yeah. friendship with her. But the one thing that she said at the conversations with Coco that made me realize why she got along so well with gay people mm -hmm. was because she was a tall woman with a deep voice. Yeah. And she had been bullied as a child because of that. I remember her saying the kids would walk up to her and look up at her and say, how's the weather up there? And of course, we laughed that night, but she was a very shy woman. And I tend to be very shy as well. Mm -hmm. And I think she became a great observer. Yes. And that's why she could deliver those slow burns and the looks. And um, I, I absorbed all of that from her growing up. Yes. And so Liza, the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I've had, had many great years with her in New York City and being able to be backstage and be there because I'm her friend was just incredible. Yeah. What I remember that night was the audience got to see a side of Liza that I wanted them to see, which was often when you see Liza on a show, they're giving her, you know, 30 seconds here. And so she puts on Liza. Exactly. Liza, given time, <laughs> yeah. she thinks yeah. Yeah. about what she wants to say and her answers. And they're always so, like, smart. Yeah. Yeah, and Jane Fonda, I just remember Jane Fonda saying cock ring. And I thought, <laughs> where else are you going to get Jane Fonda to say cock ring? Then with Coco Peru. Yes, that's exactly the way to describe it, the observation thing. Because I always felt the same way growing up. When you're not invited to sit at the table, it was a defense mechanism of where, you know, I'd be hanging out with my straight friends and they would go and make out in the woods. And I'd be like, okay, I'll be here. Like, I'll, I'll be here when you get yeah. back. And you kind of just yeah. learn what not to do and what to do. And, and you really study other other people's behaviors and that's why I always loved people of any caliber to that degree because they are so brilliant at putting on that character and painting a persona out of a time where they had to especially a B. Arthur and Eliza Minnelli when they were coming up for someone like a B. Arthur to play a, a wife on a TV show as a tall woman with a deep voice and people don't understand what you have to sacrifice and this might not be true but I know she always used to even say sometimes the digs about her appearance would get to her on Golden Girls. When she did MAME yeah. on Broadway, you know, she was the one wearing all black and whatnot. And then Angela Lansbury would come out in that white gown to take her bow. And B would have moments of, that's, I want to be wearing the white. White. Yes. I and remember I that interview. Be, I want to be the glamour yeah. girl. Yeah. Not this. And she was brilliant as Vera Charles. Yes. And yet, there was still that yearning to be something other than what you are. The other thing about Lily Tomlin that was so great was that a friend of mine had gone to a concert here in L.A., probably in the 70s, that was a gay rights concert. And Lily was part of organizing it. Yeah. And I showed her the poster and she was like, oh, my God. And I, I got to thank her for doing that. Yeah. And sort of creating a safer world so that it would be easier for me. And, and that's what oh. I try to do for youth now. And she was really moved by that. And her wife, Jane, really made a point to thank me for that moment. Oh. Because I think Lily hasn't always been, I'm a lesbian, but she was never in the closet. She never Jane hit was it. always her partner and whatnot. And so they were happy to have that recognition that night. 
Wow. And I was happy that they received it in the way that I had intended it. Yeah. And Lily was another huge icon for me growing up. I mean, I used to imitate her all the time. You are that for me. Like you're saying, when you have certain people that you meet, it's a little bit of a validation of you're on the right path. You know, you've been very uh, thoughtful to me. I want to congratulate you. Oh, on your success and your pushing forward through doing what you do. And I remember you <laughs> before you were this internet yeah. sensation. Yeah. And so um, it's incredible to have watched you uh, grow. And I have watched from the sidelines and uh, n- noticed the increase in the numbers and wow this kid's really making a name for himself so congratulations to you and the fact that you've been able to do it as an openly young queer person is wonderful for an older person like me to see well i could not have done it without people like you and whenever i'm having a tough day i watch your clip all about theater etiquette and i could watch it over and over when you're talking about people coming into fiddle around the roof late and crunching on M and M's. Selma broke out a whole Chinese meal in that show, and you know Chinese food tastes good and it smells good when you're eating it, but when you smell Chinese food and the person sitting next to you, it's like, did someone fart? What is that? It doesn't go well with sunrise sunset. It's not the vibe. No, no, it's just not like food does not any kind of food does not belong in the theater. I'm sorry. Anyway, I am going to New York to see. Good night, Oscar, with Sean Hayes. Are you in New York? I'm five minutes outside New York City, so we go all the time. Well, I'm coming to New York. We should get together. I would love that. A coffee or a meal. Yeah, that would be fun. I'd love to actually meet you in person. Oh, I would love that. I mean, you can see what a massive fan I am of you and respect your opinion so much. And I have to ask, what are your hopes or a direction we can go in to just start respecting each other, especially the... LGBT community and our art and what we do. I think queer people will always survive. And so this moment will pass. I do think young people are much more liberal and open-minded about so many things. And I think that that's why these older politicians and their supporters are freaking out is because we've made such ground and we've been so visible that young trans children can come out to their parents. Their parents can get on the internet and find information, find help. And that frightens people. They think that they've lost somehow, they've lost the country, they've lost control. And so those people will eventually die. (laughs) Bottom line. Yes, I say that all the time. They will die. Just waiting for evolution to wipe them out. Yes, they will die. And hopefully the younger people, not only is theater and storytelling important, but so is education. Very much. This country doesn't focus enough on on really educating people yeah. and paying teachers what they deserve and really making the, the system work for, for um, people. There's so much I could go on about the system not working. But I think drag queens will figure it out because we always do. Mm-hmm. Who I'm more scared for and really hurting for are, are young trans people that live in these states that um, might not get the care that they need. Yeah. Uh, and also are getting all this kind of horrible messaging. Yeah. Th- that's really how my heart breaks for. But we will survive. What really scares me, though, is, the, you know, the earth itself. It's like, how long can the earth hold on with such ignorant I know. You know, wars, nuclear this? Yes. Diseases, not believing a disease is, is you know, it's just like, okay. Yeah. Hopefully we'll all survive. Yeah. Globally. Yeah. And beyond that, hopefully people will just become more compassionate, empathetic, but it really is the young people that are going to have to do that. Yeah. Ultimately down the line. Well, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that we could not have done it without what you've done, what you do and what you will continue to do. That being said, do you have any upcoming projects or shows that we can all get excited about seeing you in? I just... And it's for a while. I need to take care of my mom. Yeah. So I go and do that every now and then. And like I said, I'm going to New York and then I'm going to go to Spain. And then I come back and I start doing the shows again. Nice. And on the East Coast and whatnot. I really thought I was close to retiring. Yeah. Every time in my career, I've tried to step away from Coco. 
something pulls me back in. Yeah. And and that, and now I really feel like oh well, well I can't pull away from Coco because well I've I know. got to show my face. Yeah. So um, I'm sticking with it for a little bit longer now. And that's it. I do want to share this with you because I don't know if you're a fan of Bianca Del Rio. Yeah. But I was just in Palm Springs doing my show. And she's sorry for the breast. Not at all. She had a beautiful grapefruit tree. And she said, would you like to take some grapefruits with you? And I said, sure. So I have a whole bowl of these. Yeah. And I'm just going to show you one. Look at the <gasps> size. That's like my face. Oh, my God. Look at the size of my grapefruit. Is that not a gorgeous grapefruit? That is stunning. You know how I love my fruits. So anyway, that's from Bianca Del Rio. <laughs> just a little fun fact. Did you know they could grow that big? It's sort of like Bianca. It's like a, you know, over the top and clownish. <gasps> Who knew Bianca had such a green thumb? But she doesn't. <laughs> she has nothing to do with that fruit growing. Yeah. I'm surprised you tree and dry up and die. <laughs> you have to, after you eat it, you have to say how it tastes. That's the real test. Yeah, exactly. I'm afraid I'm going to peel it and it's going to end up being like this big inside. Yeah. She's going to like be hysterically laughing when I call her and be like, girl, those great. <laughs> Well, I can't thank you enough for doing this. It means the world to me. And I can't wait to see what you continue to do and hopefully get to meet you in person. And you'll meet me in New York. We'll go be two New Yorkers together. Love we'll it. We'll brush up on our New York accents. Exactly. Well, thank you so, so much. Thank you.